Hello everybody, my name is Tammy Evans and I am here with Paula Kumar and we are going to talk to you today about how to avoid disputes in both commercial and employee relationships. Paula and I are both from Ignition Law and we are very pleased to be involved with the International Trade Council and their Startup Summit this year. Ignition Law we we'll go on to the next slide, is a law firm which was founded in 2015 and the intention was to set up a law firm that focused on startups and their entrepreneurial journey and a law firm which worked a little bit differently to the traditional model. We are a full service law firm and we work with startups and scale ups and we like to invest in understanding our clients business and pride ourselves on being an integral member of your team. We can assist at every stage of your business from establishing the companies, the early stage formation issues, funding rounds, employee relationships, commercial agreements, property interests. And we also have a sister firm called Ignition Financial who can assist with financial considerations also. A lot of our team are agile lawyers who have originated in city firms and have also decided to work a little bit differently. They often run a separate business or have, have other interests themselves, so they understand the entrepreneurial journey. And we use that network and a core team of permanent lawyers to deliver a team for whatever your needs are. And we are now at just over 50 people and growing quite rapidly. Paula and I focus on resolving disagreements, which is not the typical offering for a summit like this, but we think it's incredibly important for businesses to protect themselves from the start. And um, we're going to talk to you today a little bit about how you can do that. So on the next slide, you will see that we are going to break that down into three areas. First, in the context of commercial arrangements and then employment considerations. And then finally, what to do if a disagreement should crop up at an early stage. So let's start with commercial arrangements on the next slide. And firstly, on the next slide again, with shareholders. Um, life is never straightforward and it's a sad fact of reality that people fall out despite good intentions. And when that happens between people running a business who usually own shares in the business, the impact is quite catastrophic. And a shareholders dispute is the most common area of dispute we see with startups and the court focused remedies for shareholder disputes are legally quite complex, they're expensive and extremely time consuming. And all of the business's focus moves from concentrating on growing and funding and you know, progressing to dealing with that dispute. And it can have quite a damaging effect on the value of the business and any funding. So it's best avoided. And um, as we advise that prevention is better than cure. Now it's not guaranteed, but putting a shareholders or founders agreement in place can really help in the event of a dispute. And importantly, it can also help prevent these disputes and disagreements arising in the first place because people know where they stand from the start and they know what's expected of them. A shareholders or founders agreement is a legal document which is negotiated and it governs the relationship between the shareholders. Um, the terms remain confidential in England. There's, it, it's not registered at company's house, so it remains a private document. And the process of talking about it is often an important part because it's an opportunity for the members to sit down and frankly discuss the mutual responsibilities and goals, the entitlements and the obligations. We would always advise that any agreement should specifically set out how you will deal with disputes, particularly if you're a 50 50 startup. This is even more important because stalemates can be really debilitating and provisions can be agreed as to how any deadlock will be resolved. For example, a chairman with a casting vote or an independent adjudicator, or you can set out a number of steps which will escalate the problems. You should also think about what to do if one person wants to leave or dies or is made bankrupt or you can provide for something called reverse vesting, which requires a founder who holds a shareholding up front to, shell, to sell shares to the other shareholders in the event of them leaving the company, which is usually within a certain period of time. 
And you can also put in more general provisions to say that any shareholder that leaves has to offer their shares for sale to the other shareholders or the company before selling on to third parties. And you can also apply restrictions to a shareholder's ability to start a competing business, provided they're reasonable and they protect the interests of the startup only, etc. And you can also deal with the scenario where one shareholder who owns the majority of the company wants to sell it. Um, in those circumstances, a drag along provision can mean that where an offer to buy all of the shares in a company is received, which the majority shareholders want to accept, then they can force the minority shareholders to sell also. Similarly, tag along provisions where you can, a minority shareholder can force a majority shareholder that's received an offer for their shares to ensure that a similar offer is extended to the minority shareholders. And finally, shareholders often want to preserve their shareholding percentage and not have it diluted. And you can include terms ensuring that when fresh shares in the company are issued, then existing shareholders have the right to subscribe for further shares in their existing percentages. The key is to imagine every scenario and talk about it and talk about how they'll be dealt with and stress test them. And this should also be an ongoing thought process. So if you're the founder of a company and you subsequently bringing somebody new in, don't let them just work unpaid without having clear expectations and agreements regarding how shares will vest going forward, have performance criteria set out, etc. cetera. Um, once you've identified your, your key aims and concerns, then it's always advisable to discuss with the lawyer. They may highlight some missed areas and issues and they'll help you record the agreement in a written form, which is enforceable. Um, we, Ignition, have some further guides we can provide on shareholders agreement if it's of interest. Please send us an email and we'll drop those over to you. Our email addresses are going to be set out at the end of the presentation and are also on the Startup Summit's website. So on the next slide, the other topic I was going to talk to you about was contractual arrangements with third parties and the message to document everything continues into the dealings with the third parties take care over the contracts the business enters into as they really underpin the structure of your company and make sure all agreements are recorded in writing and take further advice where necessary as certainly in england there are certain requirements to make a contract valid so what kind of clauses can you have in agreements to help there are obvious elements that need to be in a contract and you should make sure that the correct parties are contracting and things like payment terms and length of contract and deliverables are all documented. But there are also terms which play an important role specifically in prevent preventing disputes or helping to resolve them. Termination, for instance, how can the parties bring the agreement to an end? What notice period should be given? What grounds allow for a termination? Set it out very clearly so there's no room for ambiguity. Um, time is of the essence is often a term that you hear referred to. And this um, is important where the timing of performance under the contract is essential. Um, it basically means that the parties agree that the timing of delivery is a fundamental part of the agreement and a failure to meet that, even by a narrow margin, can allow for termination. Otherwise, late performance may not always be considered to be an event, an event capable of termination or a breach of the contract if it's not significant. Force majeure clauses. Recent times have shown us how drastic unexpected events and phenomena can impact on everyday life and the operation of businesses. And many people talk about force majeure. It's important to remember that in England, it's not a legal concept in its own right. It's a specific contractual term that parties negotiate and sign up to. It doesn't operate outside of a contract under common law. The parties agree how their obligations will change in the event of a uh, circumstance or an extraordinary event, which is outside of their control. And the change in obligations depends on what's been specifically agreed. As with the shareholders agreement, it's a good idea to include a dispute resolution clause give some thought to how the parties will act in the event a dispute arises and what country's laws will govern the contract and the relationship and any dispute. And the parties can decide that they must negotiate before issuing a claim or mediate or have an impartial evaluator give a view on the positions or 
a number of steps again to, to escalate the problem. And it's, it's quite common that these methods are required before the parties can resort to actually issuing a court claim. Um, you can also have a, a clause that requires that the parties refer any dispute to arbitration, which is often used where there are cross-border elements. And certainly in England and Wales, the courts will expect parties to a contract to have complied with the dispute resolution clauses within their contracts before issuing a claim. It's important to make sure that whatever you agree is something you're prepared to stick to and, and to have some consideration of the costs of each step when you're negotiating it. For example, an international arbitration can be very expensive. And really that message translates into all of the um, clauses in a contract, which you would probably not give first consideration to. All of the stuff that comes after the key provisions, give it proper thought. It's too easy at the outset of a relationship when everything is positive and it's all optimistic and exciting to sign up to things which subsequently prove to be problematic. Don't just sign something without thinking it through and getting an advice. Um, you know, it's, in some respects, it's good to have the thought process that disputes will occur and look at every clause with that in mind. Now moving on to the next slide. And I'm gonna pass over to Paula. Thank you, Tammy. So one of the most important considerations when starting your business is, is how you will engage your workforce. After all, a, a good and strong workforce is key to the business becoming successful. So in this part of the presentation, we'll be looking at what you need to consider when deciding whether to engage independent contractors or employees, or as a lot of businesses do, have a, have a mix of both. There is a third type known as a worker, but for the purpose of, of this talk, we'll just stick to the more common use of self-employed contractors or employees. So let's have a look at the, the benefits and um, potential cons um, that come into play here. So from a, a contractor point of view, some of the benefits are that contractors may have specialised skills that you don't need on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, there will be less HR admin, so no need to um, have PAYE or national insurance, and there wouldn't be sick pay or, or holiday pay, um, as those things would be applicable to an employment relationship. Um, there's also a lot more flexibility, so if it isn't working out, then it's much easier to terminate the relationship generally um, just by simply giving notice, whereas with a, an employment um, relationship, there would often have to be a procedure that you, you follow in order to terminate that relationship. Um, there's also less obligations. Um, so if the workload isn't there, then you don't need to pay them. Um, if they go on maternity leave or shared parental leave, then again, you wouldn't need to, to pay those. But obviously in an employment relationship, um, you, you, you do. Um, some of the cons, um, so, contractors um, will typically work for a number of different businesses they might work for your competitors um, so it can be harder to um, enforce those restrictions um, there may also be less control and supervision um, compared to an, an employee where you have that direct line of, of oversight um, Contractors may not have the same availability that employees have. Um, they're not at your beck and call um, in the same way that employees might be. Th there could be also less understanding of the organisation. So they might not be embedded in the culture of the company or, or have the same loyalty or drive that employees um, may have. Is there the same level of teamwork? Um, they may not share the same goals of developing the company as, as employees might, which which could feed into the overall collaboration. So there's some of those um, factors are, are things that, that come into play here. Um, it's important to not only get this right from the beginning, but to continue to monitor the relationship as it may change as your company involves. So, and, and if you don't get it right, um, typically, and this may be where an individual signs a consultancy agreement, but later tries to argue that they are in fact an employee, they may have rights as an employee, um, such as the right not to be unfairly dismissed, um, the right to redundancy pay, etc. Um, so 
if we think about um, the, the terms of the contract um, and, and what needs to go in there, obviously the, the terms are, are very useful and it's um, important to reflect on how the arrangement is going to work in, in practice because um, it's all well and good having in terms of an agreement, but what the courts will look at is, is the practice. Do the terms really reflect reality here? Um, so let's have a look at some of the differences between contractors and employees. So the first one is control. Is the individual able to determine the hours that they work and, and the location that they work from? And is there direct supervision of their work? Consultants will generally have freedom to set the hours and, and schedule um, the work as they please um, and wouldn't be under direct supervision as opposed to an employee um, who would be required generally to work set hours from a set location um, and be directly supervised by their line manager perhaps. Mutuality of obligations. Um, does the company have to, have to provide regular or ongoing work? And can the individual turn down the work? So in an employment relationship, a company would be providing regular work um, and the individual would have to do it, which is very different to a consultant where there isn't that obligation to, to give regular work and the, the consultant can turn it down if, if they please. Personal service. Is the individual required to personally um, carry out the services and, and is there a right to appoint a substitute? What the courts are really looking at here is um, does personal service remain a dominant feature of the contract? So where the company has a say in the substitute um, being appointed, can, can they reject that substitute and, and what right do they really have? So an unfettered right to appoint a substitute is probably inconsistent with personal service, um, but a conditional right um, may or may not be inconsistent. And this is where the, the precise terms of the contract and the actual arrangement in practice will, will come into play here. So for example, if a company has absolute discretion um, in saying yes or no to a, a, a substitute, and that's properly consistent with personal performance, meaning that person is an employee, um, whereas if there is um, discretion which is limited to sh perhaps showing that the substitute is suitably qualified, then that's probably not personal performance, um, and that would be an independent contractor. So if we go on to the next slide, please, um, other factors. So these are some of the, the other factors that um, will be looked at in determining the, the status of the individual. So exclusivity. Consultants, as I mentioned, will generally work for several companies. Um, employees will only work for one employer um, generally, and there is probably going to be a provision in that contract that they can't work for other companies unless there is prior written consent. Responsibility for losses. So if a consultant makes a mistake, it's generally up to them to, to fix it at their own cost. Additional benefits, um, employees are entitled to sick pay and holiday pay, pension, maternity pay. They might also be entitled to additional benefits in the contract, such as um, health care or medical insurance or um, gym or death and service benefits. Um, and none of those benefits would, would be included in a consultancy agreement. Office holder duties. An employee might also be appointed as a, a company secretary or company director, which wouldn't be appropriate for a consultant. Working materials. Um, employees will provide laptops, phones, um, perhaps even a, a uniform, whereas a consultant would need to make use of their own equipment. Payment terms. Um, as I mentioned, consultant will only work for the hours, will only be paid for the hours that they actually work whereas employees are paid if, if they're on holiday or other um, certain types of leave. Next slide, please. So if you have a, a disagreement with um, your founder, supplier or employee, um, it's really key to have communication from the start. Um, next slide, please. Um, 
don't bury your head in the sand. Time can quickly pass and there are a number of time frames which you need to really bear in mind. Um, and, and the three main forms are limitation periods. Um, so there are statutory deadlines to bring a claim. For example, for a breach of contract claim, it's typically six years. Um, but for an employment claim in the employment tribunal, it's a much, much shorter period of, of just three months. Um, and there's also an early conciliation procedure which a claimant needs to go through before they can issue a claim. Um, and these are very strict deadlines. Um, and certainly in the employment tribunal, if you're a couple of minutes late filing your, your claim form, um, or defence, then it can mean that your whole case is, is rejected. So very important to, to keep that in mind. Contractual notification periods, um, as Tammy said, there may be a dispute resolution process that's set out in the agreement, which requires um, perhaps a party to send a notice of breaches and allow the other party a certain amount of time to remedy that breach before a claim can be issued. And there may also be deadlines um, set out in the agreement by which you, you need to bring in a claim. Court deadlines. Um, within the court process, there will be a number of deadlines. Um, some will be set out in the civil procedure rules. Some may be agreed between the parties and, and others are set by the court. And again, very important that you stick to these deadlines as there can be quite serious consequences if you don't comply. Um, for example, your claim or defence may be struck out or there may be serious um, cost consequences which are awarded. Um, as you probably know, litigation is, is costly and unpredictable and the courts in England encourage parties to engage in early settlement discussions. And there's a mechanism in England known as without prejudice, um, which allows parties to freely speak and have negotiations and anything said or written in, in those communications can't be shown to the court. So as long as there's a genuine intention to, to settle and, and resolve a matter, those communications are, are going to be protected. Thanks for taking the time to listen to this workshop and um, we hope that this has been helpful and useful to you. Um, if anyone has any questions then please let us know.